a scion of many worlds. The final soul is freed and is already gone as he arrives. Elsewhere, the way is shut and there is nothing to guide his way back. He leaves. Others leave. All leave. They arrive. He arrives. There is this place. She hurled me beyond time. Jasper realizes and his own words echo back to him. Words he has never said echo back to him. The countless echoes of countless others echo back to him. He is not the first person here. He is not the last. Yet he is also the first and last person here simultaneously. There are others here. He can make out a dizzying array of species, perhaps even all of them, staring back. They see him as clear as he sees them. If it's beyond time, then he should be able to get back to the moment he left so he has time in the place without. So that leaves him with a single question. How does one escape a place without time? The pathetic things try uselessly to bombard her with mere physical things. She is operating in dimensions beyond them. There is no harming her. The only one that held such capacity is gone beyond. She guides her stolen souls to reach down so she may take more. The spider's presence looks to be especially powerful. She has lived a long life compared to others, but her soul is still incomplete compared to her own. She doesn't know where this thing came from, but it's clearly no person. Of course, Jasper notes as he eyes the tiny pinch of fur hanging in midair. No time, no cause and effect, which brings about the question as to exactly how I'm even capable of movement. If there is no cause and effect, then the basic mechanics of my physiology should be halted as well. How am I even aware? I should effectively be in stasis. No, no, I should not. This is not stasis. This is something else. I am letting my assumptions run away from me, he says before suddenly remembering the scanning drone and checking. He had it clasped around his shoulder, but it's completely inert. Also, the moment he lets it go, it simply remains suspended in the air. Interesting. I am still capable of movement and perception, but nothing beyond me can move. Former pieces of my anatomy are not exempt from this, and that includes portions that might have been offering me some degree of protection. He guides the drone's mechanical legs to latch back on. That the little thing unfolded looks like a spider makes him smirk a little. For all her brilliance, his mother could not help but fall into themes. He focuses. His antenna are useless here. He can only perceive the nothingness around him. It's both alike and not alike being in a great white void. Except even white is a color. There is merely emptiness. It's not darkness. It's not light. It's not anything. He stomps and meets resistance. This prompts him to reach down and try to orient himself off of whatever this place is on a tactile front, as trusting on sight in any form has failed. His hand reaches down clear past where his feet are, and he dives through only to find he has no momentum, and the moment he sets his feet down, he is suddenly on the new upright. There was no shift in the gravity. There is no gravity. No ground either. There is only him and the echoes he had perceived. Will perceive? Is perceiving? Either way, him and the echoes. Is this place based on perception? Perhaps if he considers that he is standing on a wall two feet from the floor. He lands on his side and smirks. He crosses his legs and believes he is lying upon a wall again to slide down and sit upon the floor. Okay. So this place is shaped by my perception of it and is reacting to me. I am the cause and effect, he says while standing up. There is light. It's almost blinding. His anatomy had been adjusting to a lack of light and having hundreds of tiny eyes adjust to a sudden influx is no fun. The information to where I am is before me and obvious, he states, and nothing changes. So there is a limit to his control of this place. Or perhaps he can only perceive what is already here and must define the realm to perceive it. Too many unknowns. Perhaps I was too specific. There is a perceivable clue to the nature of this place and how it may be utilized and departed from. 
The floor shifts and he crouches down to examine it more closely. A serpent trail? There is a flash of annoyance as she feels the attacking machine rake its lasers over her while hurling metal rods and plasma. Its mere presence has altered somewhat, and even as she crosses over the wall, it suddenly starts cutting her. It's connected to the spider, and the raging bitch is clearly too dangerous to leave alive. She has to be destroyed before she spreads this knowledge to... She screams in fury and rage and the distant laser blast. The poisonous beam is suddenly tinged with touches of the beyond. More souls are blasted away. The bitch. She knows the secret now, too. No, not a serpent. That slight indentation at the edges and wearing around them. This is a Nagasha trail. It's not carrying a mere head, but a full-on person. He stands up and puts a claw to his chin as he considers. So a Nagasha was here first. What makes them unique? Evolution makes them unique. They are unlike the cases of parallel evolution, such as Arcana, Arachna, and Arachne emerging from different styles of spider or humans, Tret, Erumenta, and Alfar, all being the children of apes of some kind. They are unlike them in that they have a singular divergence point that can still be observed. Hell Lakran even has an example of such in Isarizan, a primal Nagasha, which are not the combination of all the strengths of separate Nagasha types, so much as the origin of the divergence with the other variants being in effect lesser and weaker versions. I'm missing something obvious. I know this feeling. The puzzle is already solved. The answer is here. I'm just looking at it the wrong way. My clue is that a Nagasha was here. What makes Nagasha so unique? That the many races are in fact not parallel evolutions, but descendants of a singular superspecies, and, and that's absurd, he says, and pauses before considering and shrugging. But then again, so is resurrection fighting an army of the dead, and many, many other things I've done. What's one more? There is a sensation of movement, and he turns to miss something entirely. Bullshit. If this place is beyond time, then the first person to utilize this place is still here, as is the one who will use it after me. Something is suddenly behind him, and he steps to the side to allow a transparent Greater Plains Nagasha to pass. Damn it, the foreign energy types are wearing down the drone systems. Morgana curses. We can use it, but it resists being in any kind of mechanical or electrical system to the point it corrodes it at an extreme rate. The shadow is reaching over the wall as the army scatters. Arrows, cannonballs, lasers, and innumerable elemental manifestations bounce uselessly against the screaming mass of pain and sorrow the utter bitch has surrounded herself in. The mere touch of this advanced form corrodes the wall to dust, and no one is foolish enough to engage it in melee. Morgana doesn't run. Not only is there no point, but she wants to see this monster bleed. He has to rely on sight alone. His antenna do not pick up the presence of the Nagasha image, and to be honest, his eyes don't either. As holding his claw in front of his eyes does not in any way prevent him from seeing her. Grass brown tail with curly brown hair. The Nagasha is outright plain as her species goes. No tattoos or piercings that could be taken out and repurposed as a mace. She's speaking in a language he is unfamiliar with. That doesn't stop him from perfectly understanding the meaning behind her words, though. Meaning that this is more a memory that this place is sharing with him than any kind of presentation, and it remembers understanding her. So he does so as well. She is defining herself. She defines herself as extremely skilled at magic. A deep crag Nagasha appears and she all but launches away from it, declaring it to be less than her in all ways. She cites the lack of arms as an issue before she then lunges away from a desert Nagasha. Her ability to swim has her reject a hydro Nagasha, noting her beautiful tail has her turn away from a jungle Nagasha, and she finally finds herself surrounded when a cloud Nagasha joins it. She rejects them all and declares herself more, far more than any of them. 
Well, isn't that interesting? He notes as she is suddenly a primal Nagasha, complete with the distinct hood she flares in experimentation before retracting and the numerous axiom reactive markings. She is all Nagasha, and all Nagasha shall come from her. Bitch, Horace mutters as he lets off another beam directly into the center mass of the shadow. He can see tens of souls float away free, but it's not enough. He's hit every part of the mass, and it's clear that the bitch is moving around the juicy bit he's been trying to fry. There's a distinct whine from his weapon, modifying its energy output at the source to incorporate energy from the other direction is hell on the systems. He's got maybe half of a shot left. Then he just has a heavily irradiated and energy intensive chunk of scrap metal. Come on! The blast shears away more souls, but the mass remains. The target is still up. Fucking cheating bitch! He growls out as he engages a magnetic field projector, starts twisting magnetic forces into a pretzel and eyeballs the shot. He feels a little better when the ruined husk of a gracer impacts the mass of souls at supersonic speeds. It detonates with a satisfying blast and rips away hundreds, perhaps even thousands of souls. He then engages his backup weapons and flight pack. Time to close the distance. I am an unrelenting inferno. I consume all that stands before me and hold an endless hunger for battle and conflict. I never languish in peace, but instead seek conflict to forever test myself. He declares and is suddenly face to face with a wildly grinning Urthani. There is solidity to this one a deeply predatory gaze and an eager twitch to his claws. He turns away from it, but I am so much more than that. I am a great tree. My roots always seek more water and new places to grasp at the earth. My branches and leaves ever grow wide and tall to drink the light of the sun and nourish my great trunk. I always seek new paths, he declares, and another Urthani appears. He has a dazzling smile that unfolds to reveal his proboscis is much more developed. Jasper compared his own to a spear before, but that was a toothpick to this lance. But I am so much more than that. He turns to where the next one will be. I am an endless mountain. I reach heights so grand that my enemies would choke to reach my peak. Yet depth so low that those that think they found my base can hardly understand that I am grander still. I am unyielding and impossibly vast. The next Urthani has extra antenna. In addition to the two sweeping back antenna, there is a small pair sticking out to the front and hanging over the face, and another two that stick straight upwards. The sheer power of perception this Urthani must have. He turns away from this as well. But I am so much more than that. I am a flawless gemstone. The unending pressures of life that test and press me merely refines me further. Like carbon under the heat and pressure of tectonic plates, I am as a diamond, made magnificent for the attempt to destroy me. The next Orthani to appear is the most literal one yet. His claws are reinforced and shimmering. They are coated in natural diamonds and equally as sharp as they are darkly beautiful. But I'm so much more than that. I am an unknowable ocean. I flow around all obstacles and hold unimaginable mysteries. I bear the greatest burdens with ease and may shift into a roaring tide. I am the bringer of life and the destroyer of all at my whim. The Orthani this conjures is the most impressive one yet. His wings are easily twice the size of any other Urthani, and they fold up neatly behind him. That is an Urthani who could stay in the air even without Axiom. It would be exhausting, but the wings are just big enough for unpowered flight. Barely. But I am so much more than that. Then he feels it. He has rejected so much. He has seen so much and was still unsatisfied. He is more. He is truly more. It is a truth he has spoken. He isn't altered. He isn't changed. There is no transformation or sudden enlightenment. He always was more. Therefore, he is more. The barrier between this place and places beyond is so very obvious. 
It parts before him like a curtain, and he starts heading back home, aware, but ignoring the fact that he can feel the next person's eyes on him. The metallic sheen of the soul steel incorporated into his being and sheer size are attention grabbers. It is mildly interesting that it will be a Wimpara's next. Also, laser pinchers are vaguely terrifying. I am not afraid. Morgana notes almost blandly as the great screaming mass descends towards her. The camp scatters. She's not fast enough to dodge, but many have evacuated, and nothing else has worked. Then it suddenly stops. All eight of Morgana's eyes widen as a bright light counters the shadow and unfolds into a colossal set of moth wings. Emmanuel? The probe attached to his shoulder is sending out signals again. The communicator is linked up to the network once more. He made it back. He was forced into another dimension and it took him less than a minute to come back. His wings are far too big. He has too many antenna and the sheer amount of data from the probe is causing some of her equipment to freeze. But he's back. He's back. And the shadow is outright retreating. Oh no, you're not getting away, he says, and slams forward, finding the actual body of the shadow instantly. The souls disperse as Jasper hangs in the air with the gore of the now bisected head of the shadow falling off his left claw. His wings twitch and he turns around, flicking viscera off and then slowly descends. He's enormous. He could easily look a canador straight in the eyes. Everything about him is different and yet it is unmistakably him. That crooked grin when he knows he's right. The casual saunter of someone either completely sure or trying to get out of trouble. Oftentimes both. He's shining. Whatever he did to effectively gild himself in metal has worked and appears to be quite comfortable for him now. The breeze shifts his fur to show that his throat is actually larger now, as if it were containing something extra. The extra antenna are barely given a second glance as she steps off the podium after setting her fighter drone to park nearby and go into standby. She observes him further as she walks up. His claws are now layered in such a way as to massively support enormous amounts of pressure and strain, like living weapons encased in a thin layer of pure diamond. His wings are segmented and fold up behind him as he walks forward and stops before her. Mother, even seeing you now, part of me can't believe it. Dead is supposed to mean gone, not, not coming back. She says, walking up to him and rearing up to get a better reach as she grabs him around the middle. Sorry to disappoint. You never disappointed me, Emmanuel. You've worried me sick and broken my heart, but never disappointed me. I'm sorry I never meant to hurt you. I'm back now. I'm back and I've learned so much, done so much, and accomplished so much it's going to take a long time just to get the story out. Right, but for now, just, just stay with me, my son. I will.